Okay, so this starts a microbiology section for this course. Now, this section uh, is not in the textbook. So it's a section we add in here because uh, microbiology is not required. Uh, the course is not required for nursing students, so that's why it's here. So we're gonna start off looking at viruses. Uh, oh, by the way, this is showing bacteria on the uh, head of a, a, a needle. So the, the tip of a needle. All right, so let's take a look at viruses, uh, looking at their structure of viruses. Uh, so a virion is a complete infectious virus particle. This is showing a bunch of uh, viruses here, um, except for uh, that right there. That's a hemoglobin molecule. Okay, and so one of the things you're going to see on here, it says nanometers. A nanometer is a, uh, is a billionth of a meter. So a meter is about this long. Uh, so you chop it up a billion times, that's what we're talking about and with these kind of numbers here. Uh, you're seeing this, that means micrometer. Uh, a micrometer is a thousandth of a millimeter. And a millimeter is roughly about the thickness of that line on that H there. Okay, so we're talking about very, very, very small things. Most viruses are about, you know, 80 nanometers in size, so they're pretty small. Uh, bacteria are about 5,000 nanometers, and an animal cell uh, is about uh, 50,000 nanometers by comparison. So what makes up a virus? So if we go to this next picture here, it's going to show some of these viruses here. Um, so all viruses have some genetic material. So this genetic material carries the instructions to synthesize their proteins. Um, this genetic material can be DNA or RNA, and it can be anywhere from uh, three to 200 genes in length. So this is showing some, you know, uh, right there is the, D the genetic material. Around that is a capsid. This is a protective protein container of the genetic material of the virus. So this kind of structure there is the capsid. So this is just showing just a genetic material and a capsid. So these are like the simplest uh, viruses over here. These, you get more complex as we move uh, to the left side here. So the capsids are composed of capsimers, uh, and these are the proteins that comprise the viral capsid. So they can also have viral proteins in there. Uh, these are proteins other than the capsimers. They're gonna help uh, the virus recognize and enter their host cells. Uh, they also help replicate the genetic material and they help the virus remain hidden. So a few things. Uh, so what virus can, uh, can also have besides the capsid is this kind of structure, and uh, this kind of structure there. And this is called an envelope. And so this is a membranous layer outside of the capsid that's derived from the host plasma membrane. And so these, uh, this thing is also gonna help that uh, virus remain hidden. Okay. So this is just showing a variety of different viruses here. Here's some uh, nice pictures of some viruses. Here's some more viruses as well, okay. Uh, this is a bacteriophage. Bacteriophages are viruses that attack bacteria. Uh, and we're gonna look at this uh, in terms of the next thing we're gonna talk about, and that's infection and uh, reproduction. So in order for a virus to replicate, make copies of itself in you or any other cell, the first thing it has to do is it attaches to the cell. So this viral attachment, also known as binding. So the virus must attach to the host cell by adhering to a surface molecule. And this molecule is specific. If that molecule is not present, the virus can't attach. There's no vir uh, nothing else that I'm gonna talk about is going to happen. So these viruses are specific. They bind to certain molecules, all right? So next is entry. So here uh, the virus injects its genetic material. So you can see that occurring there. It's injecting its genetic material. Or uh, let me move ahead to uh, this picture here and we see a different process here. Or that virus is engulfed by endocytosis. Uh, and then the viral particles uh, unwrap, releasing that viral genetic material. So two ways that this can occur. Most of the time, that virus just injects its genetic material, uh, which is what we see here, just injecting that genetic material. Next is reproduction. So the viral genetic material gets in there uh, and it takes over the host cell enzymes. And then it makes the cell produce more viral genetic material and proteins. And so essentially making more viruses. Uh, and so this will continue until the cell uh, 
destroys or damages or destroys this, the host cell. Okay, so that's a typical situation. Then these guys will come out and they'll infect more of these. Now, you know, let's go back to um, this uh, picture here. This is showing a yeast cell, which is smaller than an animal cell. And here are the viruses. So, you know, look at, you know, how many viruses can leave just this one cell. Lots and lots and lots of viruses can leave that one cell. Okay, so that's a normal situation. So this is showing, you know, this poor bacteria that got killed by a bunch of uh, bacteriophages there. All right, so that's a normal situation. This is what is known as a lytic infection. So looking at types of infection. So a lytic infection is a viral infection in which the viral production bursts the host cell. And so that's what we see here, just like what I talked. This is like what would happen like if you got the cold or a flu, stuff like that. Ebola would do this as well. Hopefully that never happens to you. Uh, next is a lysogenic infection. So a lysogenic infection is a viral infection in which the viral DNA is incorporated onto the host cell's DNA. So here, right, instead of just coming in here causing this to occur, what happens here is that viral DNA gets put onto the host cell DNA, all right? And so here, that viral DNA remains latent, so nothing's gonna happen for a while until there's some stressor that causes this to occur. So this is showing it with bacteria sometimes, you know, you can go through many cell divisions and, you know, those bacteria down the road can be uh, destroyed. But uh, so if this occurs in us, you got some stress or lack of nutrients to the host, something, there's some environmental stress there. And then the virus then goes into the lytic phase. All right. And then we get to, you know, the burst of the host cell and so forth. Okay. So this is, um, there are certain kinds of viruses in which this occurs with us. So chicken pox is one of those. So if you got chicken pox as a kid, you can get shingles later on in life. All right, so uh, herpes virus is another one. Uh, so if you get herpes virus, uh, it attaches its DNA er, onto the host cell DNA. Both chicken pox and herpes virus attach their DNA onto sensory nerve cells, and those sensory neurons live as long as we do. Okay, so you never really get rid of this. Uh, you can only treat the, you know, uh, the outbreak after it occurs. So you get an outbreak initially, your immune system fights it off, it goes latent, and then there's some can be an environmental stressor which can cause us to come back again. Now, I do want to point out, you know, herpes virus, there's two different kinds. There's herpes simplex one, and there's herpes simplex two. Uh, herpes simplex one is the oral herpes. So when you see somebody with a cold sore, they have herpes simplex one. Now, I do want to point out a lot of people are symptomatic for that, showing uh, symptoms, and a lot of people are asymptomatic for, for that. They don't show symptoms. But here's the thing about it. about 90 to 95 percent of the people have herpes simplex one uh so if you ever see somebody walking down the hall and you know they have a cold sore and you're like ah look at them they have herpes well the chances are so do you all right uh herpes simplex two the genital herpes uh it's not so easily seen because we typically you know uh, wear clothing over that uh but about 20 to 25 percent of the population has that uh, once again, some people are symptomatic and some people are asymptomatic as well. All right, let's look at diseases. So diseases, uh, there's going to be a host range for a disease. So these are the kinds of an organism a virus can infect. So here the cells contain enzymes that make new viruses. Uh, these cells have specific receptors to that specific virus. Uh, and they can infect and replicate in some species without symptoms. Uh, and then other things are what we call a reservoir. It is an organism that can harbor the virus that infects a different, or, uh, different species. So it doesn't uh, infect it, but it can, the virus can stay alive in that organism, and then they can pass it on to another one. All right, I want to talk about uh, HIV. Oh, this is Ebola, in case you were wondering. Uh, so let's look at uh, HIV. HIV stands for Human Immunodeficiency Virus. Uh, one of the problems with HIV is that it attacks white blood cells, our immune cells. And so, um, People who die of AIDS, they die of AIDS-related causes because uh, it kills our white blood cells, which uh, prevents us from fighting off an infection that uh, a normal healthy person could get rid of. Uh, HIV is only nine genes long, um, and it causes you know, a lot of deaths worldwide, although things are getting a lot better with medications these days. Oh, it is what we call retrovirus. Uh, so if we look at it, its viral replication uses RNA uh, as opposed to DNA. 
And so once it gets into the cell, it causes uh, RNA uh, to make uh, DNA, and then from that DNA, we make RNA, and then it makes more viruses. So it kind of has this extra step in there. And one of the problems with that extra step, though, is that uh, it can mutate uh, more readily. Now, I do want to point out there are two types of diseases. So all diseases we could uh, essentially uh, put into two categories. We have genetic diseases, and these are diseases you have at, uh, at conception. So they're in your genes. Uh, so this is things like sickle cell disease, cystic fibrosis, Tay-Sachs disease, stuff like that. And then there are acquired diseases. So these are diseases you get from the environment. So measles, mumps, polio, AIDS uh, are acquired diseases. In fact, uh, acquired is in the name. So, so uh, AIDS stands for uh, Acquired Immunodeficiency Syndrome. All right, so let's take a look at uh, HIV-2 uh, AIDS. So, how do we, uh, so this is uh, without medication, what, what we saw with people, and this is like late 80s, early 90s, uh, when people would get infected here. So once again, non-modern medicine. So what would happen here is if they got infected with uh, the virus uh, to have full-blown AIDS where their immune system was compromised, uh, they would fall into four categories. One was uh, they would get AIDS in six to seven years. One, uh, another group was 10 to 12 years. A third group was two to three years, and the fourth group got no infection at all. They never got developed AIDS, even though uh, they had uh, been known to contract the HIV virus. All right, so HIV, I don't know if I have the, the picture for this, but yeah, this sort of shows it here. HIV uses two proteins. So uh, it uses this protein called CD4 and CCR5 to grab onto our cells and then uh, get pulled into our cells to cause viral replication. Uh, so the people who are in that six to seven year group, they have two genes for CCR5, all right? Uh, so they you know, have a, a fair amount of CCR5 around their cells. Now, in order for a virus to infect the cell, it's gotta bump into the cell. So if you have more of these CCR5 proteins, then you know, by the virus just bumping into cells, it has uh, you know, more of those proteins, more of a chance for binding, more chance for infection. So the 10 to 12 year group, they have like one gene for CCR5. So they're literally producing half of the CCR5 as the six to seven year group. So that's why it takes almost twice as long for them to go from getting the infection to having full blown AIDS. Uh, the two to three year group, uh, they have a mistake in this, uh, the structure on their genes called a promoter. And the promoter causes them to make twice as much as CCR5 as the uh, 